Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Fei from the FSDC. Welcome to the Practitioner Speaker Series, where we invite seasoned industry practitioners to shed light on career prospects in various sectors of financial services and offer practical career advice to students and young talents. And we're very honored today to have two heavyweights from the fintech sector joining us today. Ms. Angelina Kwan, COO of Hashkey Group, who is also a member of the FSDC's new business committee. And Mr. Benjamin Quinlan, CEO and managing partner of Quinlan and Associates and chairman of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. Uh, thank you, Angelina and Ben, for joining us. I would also like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude towards the 15 industry associations who have provided generous support to us in bringing this webinar to the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, now, as we all know, fintech has garnered much traction in Hong Kong over recent years, particularly so in the past year when the global pan pandemic has in a way catalyzed the adoption of technology in our day-to-day -day life, as well as in how financial services are provided, uh, which I'm sure many of you are very interested in learning more about. So today's webinar is divided into two sessions. For the first session, I have pre prepared a list of questions, which I think might be of interest to our audience. And in the meantime, you're invited to type in your own questions in the Q&A box, uh, which I will invite our uh, speakers to address uh, in the later Q&A session. So uh, as, you can, as you can see, our speakers are with here, to, uh, with here on the screen already. So without further ado, I would like to uh, kick off the webinar by inviting them to say hi to our audience and give us a brief introduction of yourselves, your career path, and how you devel developed a passion for uh, FinTech. Perhaps uh, Angelina would like to start first. Sure, thank you, Faye, and thank you to um, uh, FSDC and all our supporting partners. And most of all, it's nice to see um, Ben. It's been a while since I've seen him, so I'm very proud and happy to be on a panel with him. Um, thank you all uh, participants for coming today. Um, i share you a little bit about myself. Um, I, I was born in a black plantation. No, just kidding. <laughs> that came from a movie. Um, what I did do is I came to Hong Kong um, uh, in the early 90s, and uh, it's been an exciting adventure ever since. And um, my life has been spent mostly in the controls function. Uh, so I uh, came as a certified public accountant and then got my law degree in Hong Kong. And right now I'm pursuing a law degree. So I would really say that lifelong learning um, is very, very important. And that's why I'm so uh, motivated with um, what our content of today's uh, course is. So um, I uh, spent various stints in investment banks, but what really changed my life was I got an opportunity to join the regulator. And for those of you who are looking for different opportunities, spending a period of time in either the Hong Kong government or working with a regulatory uh, agency is fascinating. And it's something that um, is something you should think about. Uh, but I spent uh, eight years at the SFC and uh, I regulated Hong Kong exchanges and clearing. And later I uh, joined Hong Kong exchanges and clearing. I first got involved in Bitcoin when I advised a young man <clears throat> um, who came to Hong Kong and uh, he was so impassioned about uh, digital assets and, and FinTech um, and he asked me how to get a license and, uh, and in payment, I was going to charge him my usual fee. Um, and, but I then said to him, why don't you give me some of this stuff that you're talking about, this thing called Bitcoin. And, um, he gave me five Bitcoin for five hours of work, um, and I've never sold that Bitcoin. And that young man now has started um, a firm called Bitfinex, which is one of the largest uh, exchanges in the world now. So um, it was a learning experience for me as well as for him to work on, on regulatory stuff. So uh, that's how I got into Bitcoin and, uh, uh, and digital assets. And then from there, after working at the exchange, I then joined a, a global firm uh, where I was the global COO. And then I am now with a firm called Hashkey uh, where I'm the group COO and trying to get the license, the second license for um, an exchange in Hong Kong. 
So uh, lots of opportunities in this area, and we'll talk more about that. So that's my brief, Tracy. Thank Over you. you uh, so from the industry to uh, a regulator, and then back to the industry, I would like I would say it's probably a path uh, quite rarely taken. Uh, so what about Ben, how how about your story? Oh, just to be clear, for those of you who ever want career advice from Angelina based on the current price of Bitcoin, her going rate is 275,000 US for a few hours. So uh, I, I might pass on that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in any case, uh, I've known Angelina for many years uh, through various different dimensions of a relationship. And I've seen her move from strength to strength in so many different uh, careers, which has been great. Um, now for my less, what I would call exciting career journey. So I'm originally from Hong Kong. I was born and raised, uh, well, I hung on Tatai, right? My mother's Chinese and my father's Australian. I got my posh accent in Australia. I was sent down to Sydney when I was 12 years old, did my boarding school and university. And I got my first job at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, in M&A tax. And I got that job because it's the only company that interviewed me out of every single one that I applied to. <laughs> but I always wanted to get an investment banking. Um, I had that M&A experience there. I always wanted to get involved in deals. So I found a path at UBS in Australia and I got the opportunity to work in strategy under the Australian CEO. Uh, but for me, I wasn't a big fan of giving up half of my earnings in tax and working pro bono for the other half year. Um, I missed the buzz of Hong Kong. So I asked for a transfer and I came back to Hong Kong working in a group strategy and M&A function for UBS. Um, as I spent more time there, maybe because of my personality, they popped me into a client coverage role and it was a new function looking after the hundred biggest accounts from a group perspective in Asia Pacific for the UBS group. I remember during that time, there were a lot of consultants that came through and presented to us. Uh, and I was always quite impressed by one particular firm, and that was Oliver Wyman. And I remember the partner there was very savvy, he was really knowledgeable. And uh, I reached out to him one day and said, do you want to have a coffee? And I think I didn't put any context and he knew straight away that I was after a job. And he said, would you like me to give you a job? So I went through that process. And it was a really cool experience. Uh, OW was uh, a great platform for me to learn how do I earn my consulting stripes and how do I think the way that these consultants think? Because I always thought they were the, the brightest of the bright. But I did realize something. I did realize that all the consultants I was working with had never spent a day in the organizations that they were advising. And for me, I found there to be what I would call an intellectual disconnect with reality. Um, and being able to create a lot of great ideas, but very few things you could actually put into practice. And I actually took seven months off. I had a break from my career. Um, I started doing stand-up comedy. This is my other hat that I do as a job. Um, I'm not very funny, but I have a good time. I miss touring and all of that, but I had seven months off and that was a really good experience for me. And to Angelina's point, if there's one thing I would advise anyone to do in their career, it's to take a sabbatical. It's to really just have that time off introspect and work out what do I want to do, what excites me and so on. But after that time, I got tapped on the shoulder by a few organizations and then Deutsche Bank offered me a role as the head of strategy for their global markets business here in Asia Pacific, which expanded from equities to then full global markets to the investment bank. And after about a year, I was leading a major project and I got offered the global head of strategy role in London for Deutsche Bank, which I did not take because I always thought I wanted to do my own thing. And I decided in the end of 2015 that I wanted to launch my own consulting firm. Uh, I had the benefit of working in-house in strategy and with private practice. And I thought, how can I combine the best of these two worlds and work out what is fundamentally missing? Because I know during my experience with lead projects and I never saw a client smile and say that was worth every penny and that was great. But I wanted to give that experience, which is exactly why I set up Quinlan and Associates. So I've been running the firm for five years now. We're a financial services uh, strategic consultancy. We look after all kinds of clients from the big banks through to stock exchanges. Uh, we do a ton of work in FinTech, especially in Angelina's space with digital assets, crypto as well. 
And, uh, and then over this cycle, there's a few other hats that I've been wearing. So I'm now the chairman of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong, which is the representative body for the community here with about 1,700 members. Um, and I also sit on uh, advisory committees and panels for the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, for AFF, for Hong Kong Science and Technology Park, and I'm a, an ambassador for the Hong Kong Tourism Board as well. Um, so yeah, very exciting. I have, you know, I've never thought I would end up where I've ended up. No way. Uh, careers are often very interesting and like windy journeys. So with me, I, I've enjoyed every step of, uh, of that journey. And, you know, Angelina and I have to share as much insight as we can today as you embark on that step of your journey too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben, for sharing with us this truly remarkable journey. And I can imagine it's, it's, it's a handful of responsibilities to juggle. And, in fact, and I learned new uh, stuff about him today, too. So that's great. <laughs> so we've all learned something already. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, as the uh, chairman of FinTech Association of Hong Kong, I feel like Ben would be the most suitable person to, you know, decipher the concept of FinTech for us. Mm -hmm. Because we know, you know, FinTech broadly refers to the crossover space of financial and technology. Mm -hmm. And there's like uh, virtual banks, virtual insurers, uh, uh, blockchain, crypto assets, et cetera, et cetera. So can I invite uh, Ben to tell us a bit more about what you think FinTech really encompasses and what are some of the uh, key fields where uh, you know, opportunities lie? It, this is a great question because when I took on the chairman role, uh, I realized that the FinTech Association was structured under 14 different committees. And if you ask people, where do you sit in the ecosystem? It's really complicated to work out what we call FinTech taxonomy because you have different dimensions. You have your industry dimension. So virtual bank, virtual insurer, uh, you have wealth tech, insure tech, right? So the industry plays. Then you have the technology, AI, big data, cloud, cybersecurity, blockchain. So those are the tech layers. Then you have the application layers like payments, reg tech, like cyber, right? Then you start to get in this whole view of where does it all sit? Now, the new structure of FinTech Association of Hong Kong is there's three core, uh, four core industry verticals, I am I right? It's digital banking and payments because they're so intertwined. We have insure tech, we have wealth tech, we have blockchain, and then we have what I would call the functional and tech layers, AI, big data, cloud and cyber, uh, and uh, oh, this is terrible. Uh, big data, cloud and cyber, and blockchain. There's four of them. And then one final committee, which is all about, we call it future foundations. So this is a more thematic, group where we talk about, um, you know, different things happening in industry, innovation trends, financial inclusion, d &I. It's really great. And that's a little bit more of an open style forum. So don't get too confused by the, the fintech landscape. Um, but there are a lot of areas that I would say, you know, straddle what I would call improving traditional areas of finance, right, where fintechs plug into traditional banks and insurance firms to make them more efficient through the use of technology. And then the other side is what are called the disruptive areas where firms are fundamentally challenging from the grassroots up to contend against these players. So that's probably the cleanest synthesis I can give it of it, but I'm sure Angelina has a lot more context around it. No, I would agree. Um, I just think one thing that um, tech does do, and there was a question that just flew through the chat I saw as, um, are their positions, are they mostly back office and middle office positions? And I think many of the tech firms that I've seen or uh, worked in is people are independent, individual con contrib contributors. Um, so are you front, back, middle, side? Um, everybody is an individual contributor and everybody contributes to the firm and uh, it doesn't matter where you are, it's what your skills are and where you can help the firm. And that's what you're seeing, um, especially with a lot of startups and what you're seeing with a lot of the big tech firms. Um, so um, I wouldn't think in that way, but I agree with Ben uh, in terms of uh, FinTech is financial and tech together. Um, in its most simplistic form. And um, there's so much to do. So it's not just financial anymore. It's, it's a lot of different areas merged together. Yeah, thank you. So since it's a lot of uh, different areas merged together, what, 
I mean, maybe I'll direct uh, this question to Angelina. What do you think are some of the major uh, job categories or job roles that are arising from these opportunities? And you know, what was the industry uh, trend in terms of career prospects? Um, I used to tell young people, go north, young people. Uh, and everybody thought I was insane. When I say go north, that means go to China. Um, and uh, because China is a land of opportunities um, and it used to be, oh, everybody go to the West Coast or East Coast, but I think China is definitely a place to go. But what are the opportunities right now? Um, in terms of the financial and technology side, an area that in fact, Faye and I were talking about was developers, um, people that can code, people that know how to code, people that can write programs. Uh, the young man who wrote the program uh, that uh, built this global exchange that I work for, um, he was brilliant, uh, he still is brilliant. Uh, and he basically wrote the code for an exchange in a period of a couple of months. And he did it all by himself and he figured it out. And this is the thing that Hong Kong needs more of. And we have to bring in people from around the world because there isn't enough of that area. So um, if you're uh, currently studying in school or want to think about what kind of major you wanna go into, coding is one area. The other area is data, data sciences and data analytics. This is the hottest area. And before uh, the financial crisis, I couldn't hire a single data scientist at all. Um, and they were like calling for huge salaries. So anybody that knows how to analyze data and can interpret it and help companies use their data in a better manner, that's a, a, a very, very hot area. The third area that I think is really, really hot is just because you're a startup doesn't mean that you should be badly run. And there's this, this view that startups, oh, we don't have any controls. And people that have a control background, either accountants, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, consultants, uh, are, are definitely needed uh, in the FinTech area. And just because you're a startup doesn't give you an excuse to say that you don't have controls in place. And um, no matter what, uh, you're trying to protect your assets as well as the assets of the firm. So that's that's still there. Um, and then finally, I think the areas of sales and marketing, they're still there and good sales and marketing that understand the areas of what they're selling are really, really important. And I don't need a salesperson that's just going to like, oh, just buy this. I need to know how this can work within my ecosystem and why should I be buying this? Um, and it's the same thing for um, people that are implementing these systems, the people helping implement the systems are really greatly in demand. I've been trying to find somebody to implement a certain system and the, the, the costs of doing so have gone up four times from the time I first implemented. So that's another big growth area. So those are five areas, implementers, uh, as well as coders, control, sales and marketing that know what they're doing. And you know what? If you don't have any of these skills, just being open to learning and being open to going out there and knocking on doors and asking for jobs and just being not proud uh, and just going out and asking for a job and learning and doing the best you can, that's already one big area that we're looking forward to in this field. So those are just some of my thoughts. Over to you, Ben. Oh, like really spot on. I mean, I, I maybe, I'm going to incorporate all of Angelina's views because they're exactly right in a slightly different narrative. So if you work with, let's say, an early stage startup, there's only two things you effectively need. Someone that can build the product, right? So your coders, your developers, and so on, and someone that can sell and develop the business. Now, you need those things in place. And depending on what kind of a, a, you know, a FinTech player you are, you might need the controls in place from day one, right? Um, but overall, the idea is you need to build something and then you need to commercialize it. You need people to use it. You need people to want to use it. And usually on that frontline team, when you think about business development, it involves what I would call the halo marketing effect, people that can sell, people that can raise money for you, 
people that can tell really good stories because mm. a lot of the time you have to buy into a vision. Some of these new things aren't done. So you're educating people on a product and not just in terms of that core narrative, but to go to Angelina's points, the detail around what this will do for someone and how it will integrate with their system and how it will make their lives easier. And it's not going to cause more complexity because that's often a stumbling block for many uh, startups in the ecosystem. And as the company matures, naturally, all these new functions start to develop around it. The dedicated operations person to make sure the engine keeps moving in the right way. Uh, sales and marketing, IT and infrastructure and cyber, very, very important to the integrity of these firms. Um, but I couldn't agree more with the data analytics. So I'm an adjunct professor at uni and I teach uh, big data analytics. It's something I'm super passionate about. And the reason why you need to understand data is it's the language of business. It's also the language of digital. So you cannot have any digital platform operating in the world if, it, if the data that sits behind it is not robust, clean, labeled, um, structured. Uh, you know, I can run through all these terms to the nth degree, but overall, data is the language of the digital age. So you really need a good understanding of that. And that you know, that's the way I see as companies mature, then they bring in HR people, you know, even some of the big fintechs we know, um, you know, 2000 plus people calling me up saying, hey, we're about to lose our, our uh, visa uh, permit application ability from the Singapore government because we keep hiring too many foreigners. And the Ministry exactly. of Manpower has stepped in saying, what are you doing? You have to advertise to locals. And they go, do we need an HR strategy and a function? It depends on where the company is in its life cycle. But if you're thinking very early on, someone that can build and someone that can sell and business develop, sell to investors, sell to clients, sell to partners, especially very important, build that ecosystem around them. But uh, yeah, all the normal jobs that come in with a traditional financial institution or any well-run organization will present themselves as a company matures. So basically the opportunities are there. It it really comes down to who you are, where your aspirations lie, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we've set the scene uh, and given an overview of the uh, industry landscape, let's talk from a personal perspective. Uh, why would you think a FinTech would be an uh, industry, you know, good for someone to start their career in? Uh, and this is where I want to go uh, deeper into your personal stories. What are some of the proudest moments or your biggest achievement uh, throughout your career that you know you would like to share with us Angelina wow <laughs> proudest moment um I guess I have a few that I'm really um proud of uh but I think in terms of from a fintech point of view uh in the firm that I worked with before, where I was the global COO, there was a time um, I was given, because we hit a certain target, I was actually told um, by the founders to please um, uh, do something nice for the staff. So I was able to take all of the staff on a trip, all expenses paid, including their families to, um, to a certain place, let's just say that. And that certain place was an amazing place. And um, we had taken a specific location for the day and it was a secluded location that was just for us. And as we walked around, everybody was having fun. The families were running around and um, every, there was an Easter egg hunt and stuff like that. And as I was walking through and I saw um, my customer service reps were all in swimming suits and they were all huddled around their computers. And it was the first time 60, 60 of them had ever met. And they were all huddled around the computers around this beautiful location, but they were all staring at the computers and working out how could they work better. As I tell you this story, I still get pins and needles because I was so proud of them. How can we work better? How can we be better customer service people? How can we address our clients? How can we um, deal with issues that are coming up? And they were all asking, I didn't interrupt it. I just stood there watching and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. These were young people, old people um, that were located around the world that did customer service. 
And I think that was one of my proudest days. And I never, actually, I never told anybody about this. So you guys hear, heard it here first. Um, but that the, the fact that they could work together and share um, when they had never even met them, met each other. They only knew each other by their handle and they only knew each other as customer service reps. And to see them working together and collaborating together, um, I had uh, achieved my dream of one dream, one team. And that was the mantra that I had tried to make for this firm of one dream, one team. And uh, that was the day that I felt was my biggest um, uh, uh, success. So that was mine. So <laughs> it's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's, okay. that's, that's really cool. I, I look. I maybe I'll tell you about a pepper journey. I think that's that's really cool, especially you know I, I can relate to that in Angelina's position because when you actually see it happen and you see teams bonding and gelling like that and just delivering because they, they share a common vision, purpose, goal. It's a really good feeling in the business world, especially when you spend so much time with conflict and headbutting and so on. It, it happens a lot in organizations. Um, the proudest moment for me was by far in a way, and I can talk about some instances within the firm, but, but going out on my own and, wow. and setting up yeah. my own firm. And, you know, I, when I got offered the role as the global head of strategy, I was 30 years old at Deutsche Bank and my Chinese mother, uh, it's not easy to tell a Chinese mother that you're not going to take this job for an income of zero, <laughs> right? That you are going to go out and get paid officially nothing and you're going to give up that big check and all the big title and all her bragging rights to her mahjong friends because your son is going to go do something crazy and i i just had the biggest strongest self-belief that i could do it um and the the thing that's really cool is in the world of fintech you can invent yourself and reinvent yourself because the industry changes so fast so when people go, oh, I'm a crypto aficionado and I'm someone in this, where did that come from? Like, you know, all of these new things came out. And I said, if you are prepared to put in the time, effort, energy, research and resources into learning and being the best in a particular field, you will be the best in that field. There's no question about it because you went out and did it and you put everything yep. to, at your disposal behind it. Um, but that, that Q&A thing, I remember when I launched and I, I got my first project on the first day I set up the company. I went to a coffee shop and it was an ex-colleague of mine at Deutsche. And I remember my last few days there, he goes, do you know how much McKinsey costs? And I said, why? And he said, well, my sister runs an international school and she's looking for a consultant to come in and help her. And I said, well, you know, I'm leaving. So maybe I can just have a coffee first. And I went and had the coffee and just straight away, all the mechanics of exactly why I wanted to do this kicked in. I drafted a proposal. I sent it. I met with the board and they signed off the very next day. And I thought, wow, that is the coolest experience in the whole world. And there was, it was a lie. It was no Quinlan and Associates. It was Quinlan and just there was no associates. And then it was Quinlan and associate, right? I mean, the whole, the whole, that whole experience was really cool. That as we matured as a firm, and I'm sorry I can't isolate it to one thing because I never got excited by working in the old organizations. I love my job. Um, and people go, oh, workaholic, this and that. It's not that. I just love what I do because I get I get paid every day to give advice and to learn as we go along, right? Lever you're leveraging new knowledge that continually builds on new knowledge. And then you yep. find out as you end up that process, my gosh, I've built such a rep repository of expertise in so many different areas that this allows me to then scale and do more in that space. But you know, it really boils down to me is the proud thing goes back to what Angelina said, which is why it resonates. It's people. It's really the people around yep. me and the team and seeing the willingness and the hunger and the same shared value and vision that my team has had from day one and people choosing to turn their back on a traditional like safe bet consulting firm and saying, no, I like what you are doing. I believe in the vision because you need people in an organization like that. You can't have people that suck, suck the life out of a new firm. You need people that are givers and everyone is in this together. And we're all about growing the pie 
And you have to trust the CEO to make sure he rewards everyone at the end of it in the right way, um, which I've always maintained that mantra up. Get rid of the politics. You see when we put out a job ad, hundreds of applications come in. And I'm very flattered to see such a strong interest in people working at the firm. I've had people call me up and say, I work at Goldman Sachs as an executive director. I would like to work with you. And that's straight hand on heart. I said, I would love you too as well, but I can't afford you. And they, their first response is, I'll take an 85% pay cut to go and work in the organization just so I can learn how you guys do it and the, the cool projects that you work on. That for me, like when I look at that ecosystem of how we're building, it's super fun. And that just makes me so excited every day. And the final thing is whenever we deliver a project to this day, at the end of the project, you see the smile on the client's face and you see them always come back. And for me, that was the mission that I set out to do. Never leave an unhappy client there and always over deliver and overwhelm a client with the fact that you know how to connect what is called a huge amount of data research and insights to their specific problem. And it's not just some template in nowhere, right? Um, that's such a great feeling. That That's the thing that makes me happy every time I, I do a project. Not the sale, the close. Mm. No, I agree. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. I think it's very interesting, almost heartwarming to hear that both of you mentioned that people is the key because at the end of the day, uh, whether it's clients or colleagues, it's the people that you work with, that you work for, that gives you the biggest sense of fulfillment, mm. right? Okay, so uh, the... Our webinar is titled Myths and Realities. So I think uh, a lot of our audience will be very curious to find what you think is the biggest myth uh, of FinTech, because I, I think to this day, still some of us find it somewhat a mysterious field because of uh, probably just simply a lack of understanding and uh, firsthand experience. So can I uh, invite Angelina to start first uh, to share with us, what do you think is the biggest myth about FinTech and why it may not be true. Um, I sort of mentioned a little bit that one myth is that startups, oh, you're allowed to do anything um, and you're allowed to get away with bad controls or you're allowed to do whatever you want. Sorry, that's a really bad myth. And um, I've seen so many startups start up and they were like, wah, really, really uh, um, a huge flame in the sky until they flame out. And um, one myth is that, um, yeah, you can work really hard, but you need to work smart and you need to put in controls in place. Um, and as my boss, Mark Dickens, uh, who used to be, in, be with uh, FSDFC and one of the board directors, he always said, you know, Angelina, if the world was perfect, we wouldn't have regulators. So um, <laughs> I always took that to heart in terms of something he said. So the first myth to bust is um, running, a good, uh, running a bad company or running a startup company does not mean you run a badly controlled company. You need to run a good controlled company and you need to have checks and balances in place. And you need to make sure that there's honesty in the staff that you work with and um, uh, that people do the right thing. Um, the second myth I want to bust is um, it's fintech is a fascinating area, um, but it, like any other job, has its ups and downs. Um, it can be sexy um, and it can be bloody boring. And guess what? You still have to do the bloody boring um, when it means that Angelina has to sit there and um, move chairs around or whatever it takes. Um, then guess what? You're going to have to do it um, because there's nobody else there to do it for you. So <laughs> I have moved chairs. Uh, I have moved offices. I have moved people. <laughs> um, so there is no amount of sexy in that. Um, but if you have to do the job, you will do it. And that's part of the job. And you are paid a amount of money. And that's the Faustian uh, pact that you make that if you're getting paid, you will do your job, whatever it happens to be. And every day, I mean, I don't know when I walk into the office sometimes what, the, what that day will bring in, but 
There are bloody boring days that I just sit there correcting papers and literally correcting font and correcting the wording and making spelling and grammar changes. Uh, because guess what? Those application forms or those documents will be a part of a application to a regulator or it could be a policy. Um, so there is no, it's not gonna be sexy every day. It could be just sitting there and reviewing papers. And I'm sure in the consulting business, it's the same. Um, I'll end with the last myth in terms of, God, you'll make a lot of money. Well, guess what? <laughs> um, if you don't make your startup or your company uh, profitable, you're not gonna make a lot of money. So don't expect it. Um, if you make a good day's wage and you're making what you're expected to be making, and sometimes I, I've done a lot of jobs for nothing um, uh, because I'm helping people and I mentor a lot of people. I don't expect anything back from these people. Um, if they do well and they remember to give me some shares one day, great. If they don't, that's okay too. And, um, but I learned in the process and I think that's something that Ben said too. You're not gonna make off of every single deal. Um, and I love the fact of being able to help young people and to mentor young people and old people too. So let's not be ageist here. Um, there are new uh, startups made up of old people and new young people. So um, I think that's something that um, you have to get that myth. That's a myth buster. So um, just be prepared. And if you get something out of it, great. If you don't, then, you know, as you as a person will be much better out of all of it. So that's just some thoughts in terms of myth busters. Over to you, Ben. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. So a couple of myths. Everyone thinks that join a startup is going to be the next big thing. I can promise you most of them will fail. Most. Okay. Um, that's just a fact. So when you go into these environments, when you are sold a story and idea and whatnot, let's just take some simple product like EKYC. For those of you who want to know what that is, E, know your customer, a digital solution for onboarding uh, an individual to your organization. It's basically instead of filling out all the paper forms and so on, you take a selfie, you take a photo of your ID, a photo of address proof, and they route through all these systems, do a background check, ensure you're not a terrorist, you know, financing, da, da, da. And they go, tick, you are on board, right? We've done all the checks for you. There are over 600 EKYC solutions in the market. Wow. All of them kind of work. 600. So you think about the competitive landscape. FinTech has exploded in terms of competitive environment. And because of that, there are questions as to which ones will ultimately be successful. And like any industry, when you go through this euphoria and growth stage, you will naturally see a lot of contenders vying for that big magical pot of money that will come at the end. But there will only be a few winners. And in any industry that you look at across the world, there's always a few winners. It doesn't mean that there can't be multiple contenders or challengers, but there's always a couple of firms that really have carved out a niche as the dominant players within that space. And, you know, it's the same kind of thing with fintech, potentially a little bit more capacity for fragmentation, given how wide the net is when you talk about fintech. Um, AI. A lot of people say AI. Uh, be very careful around the term artificial intelligence. Often when I find it means I've built a macro or I've just done some robotic <laughs> process automation, I will say that is not artificial intelligence. So the word is thrown around a lot. Um, be mindful of when a company talks about AI, what does that really mean? What is their neural network and what is the AI tool being trained to do from a machine learning perspective? And really a lot of it is sometimes not as sexy when you realize what the company is actually doing, streamlining existing processes, automating things that were done manual, boop, 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 like basic checks and balances and processes. And you think, is that all it's doing? Yeah. And as a result of that, the customer journey has gone from a five day onboarding period to that three minute experience because all those building blocks were put in place. Um, that there is a, a clear career path Absolutely not. Um, I think the career is what you what you make of it in fintech. 
And that is why coming in with a growth mindset and the willingness to roll up your sleeves is very important. And to go to Angelina's point, the amount of shitty things I have had to do as a CEO and chairman, forget the titles. This is my ability to go out and have a conversation and put a face forward to a client and put some credibility behind it. But if a client knows I have to go to the office and I'm moving desks and I'm the Sifu that day, right? Because I have to help, everyone has to help. That's part and parcel of the job. But with that excitement and all those things comes you know, some of the negatives and realities of, of this isn't within a normal JD. So I think for those of you who say this isn't a bullet point in my job description, the startup and fintech ecosystem is going to be a challenge. So you have to have that willingness to say, I'll do whatever it takes, obviously within reason, but I'll do whatever it takes to see this firm grow, because I know that the mission and everything that I'm behind, we're all in this together. Um, and that's the great thing. And that's all the talent that I always look for. Are you the kind of individual from a cultural perspective who will really understand this mission and be on board when we're sitting there at that group offsite and we're not clashing with each other and, oh, this wasn't quite in my JD? Because at the end of the year, I will know that wasn't in your JD. And you know what? When you were asked to do those things and you stepped up, there's the number to reflect it, right? So there's a lot of the trust in that. Um, and then I finally would like to say, it's not just about the product. A lot of people put so much emphasis on the product. What does the product do? How does it work? This is the best product. You have to have a good, viable, commercializable product. There is no doubt about that. But look at the team. Look at the founders and look at the team. Because ultimately, if I, because I'm a fintech investor myself, um, my wrong bets haven't been on companies that don't have a great product. My wrong bets is because I didn't trust my gut when I realized it wasn't the right founder. So yep. you have to be mindful of the people running and leading the organization because the big myth is this product will save us. It won't. Because at the end of the day, if you're a tech company, the only thing that makes you successful is the people in your organization to bring that tech to market. It is still fundamentally a people business and every business you're in, the five rules of business, the most important things, people, 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 and people. There's nothing else, right? You've got to get that right. So yeah, those are my myths that I hopefully have quasi busted. <laughs> totally <laughs> agree, Ben. Totally agree. Uh, thank you for demystifying FinTech for us, especially the uh, sort of downside to it, which is also very important to, to know. Um, also, I'm glad to see that we still have uh, 235 with us, so they're not discouraged wow. by what have you have shared. Uh, so for those uh, most committed, let's talk about the most practical uh, issues. What, uh, what are some of the qualities that you look for when you hire? So for someone who is aspiring to enter into the industry, what would be your advice? Uh, Angelina, would you like to go first? Um. I interview candidates every day. And I think being humble and um, just willing to work, uh, being approachable, collaborative. I'm not an MBA. <sighs> that doesn't impress me. Um, and um, just being approachable in terms of, I have to spend 20 hours a day with you if you're miserable to work with, I really don't want to be with you. I really, really do not want to be with you. So 20 um, hours, is that the expected uh, hours if you enter into a fintech? Literally, when I was that global COO, that's what I literally worked, um, 20, 25 hours a day. And I'd wake up in the morning and then it's the leftover of Europe, then Hong Kong, then Europe opens again, then New York, then we start again. So, I mean, if you don't get along with your colleagues or if your colleagues are difficult to get along with or if they whine all the time, it's miserable to work with them. Um, so being a collaborative team where you can laugh at each other, where you can um, actually um, uh, uh, have fun together uh, when you have a chance um, is really, really important. And sometimes it's that five minutes at uh, the water cooler uh, that you just spend time just talking to each other. That's really, really important. 
the other thing is to be an expert. What are what are areas um, and uh, uh, that you're an expert in? Whatever it is, that's the area you should highlight, and that's the area that you should go into. So some of the UX designers that I saw uh, that I worked with were amazing, and the things that they did, they were so proud of even just down to the little color or color change and how the website would work and stuff like that. It is that precision and that proudness of what you do, even if it's down to one sliver of color, um, it's that perfection uh, that you wanna get to without being overly anal. Um, so that's another area. And I mean, don't promise more than you can actually do. Uh, if, if this is what you can do, then that's what you can do and don't promise anymore because people will expect something from you. And you, when you can't do it, then that's something that will be a strike against you. Um, in terms of other qualities, um, being able to learn quickly um, and assimilate information and to what Ben said, uh, interpret the information. And that's worth a lot of money right now. Being able to interpret and having the experience um, to, to be able to interpret. Um, so get as much experience as possible. I saw a question fly through about um, how do we get into management consulting? Um, get as much experience as possible. Um, and that's how you get into management consulting. Yeah. Over to you, Ben, what do you think? Okay, so I, I wrote a post on LinkedIn a while back in terms of the skill sets for the future. And, you know, I think a lot of these are applicable wherever you go and whatever you do. Uh, number one, as a consultant, I hold this dear to my heart, it's critical thinking. Because I think a lot of the time we live in an age where it's so easy to go on your phone and say, Google said this, Twitter said that. Critical thinking is a skill set that I think people have badly dropped the ball on. And the ability yep. to go in and analyze and pick things apart and really see both sides of the argument. Because at the end of the day, you know how you go on YouTube, you watch a video, and guess what? Next time you log on, there's a similar video. And all this is doing is reinforcing your position time and time again. What I often force myself to do is look at the other side of the table, because I can tell you what, there's always two sides to an argument. And the reality is it doesn't matter how nice you are, how good you are to people. There's always going to be people that don't like you. And there's always going to be, there's no such thing in the history of mankind and humankind that we've ever unanimously agreed on. There are a, a few million followers in the flat earth society. Let's just be clear, right? These are people <laughs> that believe the earth is flat. We live often, I say, in an age of anti-intellectualism. And for me, that's quite saddening to see people taking such shortcuts that critical thinking has gone down the toilet. And what is critical thinking about? It really is about one is problem diagnostics. So identifying the problem, not just saying it's a problem. Why is it a problem? Where is it a problem? What is the root cause of the problem? And then problem solving. So once you've identified, how do you solve it? So that's really what critical thinking is about. Next one, data analytics and visualization. You should know how to read data, interpret it, present it, synthesize it. Whatever job you do, that's the language of business. Communication, very, very important, both verbal and written. And, you know, this is the ability to be concise, clear, compelling, and do it in different scenarios, whether it's networking, sales, negotiation, persuading people. I often see people lack a lot of empathy in discussions because they forget the other side of the table has another position to you. So you have to empathize with the audience. Um, and I relate to this a lot because I'm a comedian and I can't go up on stage and say, this is what I think is funny, ha, 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 ha. I have to watch the audience real time and say, what are people reacting to? Where am I getting the hits? What's falling on deaf ears? And that will help me craft that narrative throughout a show. Communication, very important. And writing. I think a lot of people, sloppy writing, right? Um, be clear, be to the point. Long, long emails are out. Just be very clear around what you want to say. Uh, project management. So that's the ability to lead, embrace an ownership mindset really know how to manage different stakeholders, manage up, manage down, manage sideways. There's multiple parties involved in the ecosystem, whatever job you have. You need to be good with people and managing and collaborating. Digital literacy is very important. 
read up on key technologies, understand what their applications are in the real world. Who is actually launching these products and services? Who are the disruptors? Who are the traditional? The more you understand from a digital literacy perspective, the more you can speak the language of what is the new world of business. Uh, emotional intelligence, this is really important. So this is cross-cultural and interdisciplinary awareness, I call it. You need to understand, I, I mean, my view is I come from two parallel universes in terms of mom and dad. You know, my mom is the comes to me every day and gives me feng, feng, yeah, feng shui advice, like Benjamin, don't put your couch in front of the front door or it will block the energy to your house. And I say, mom, it will also block me from coming into the house. So that's quite logical. And then I have my dad that goes, mate, just don't listen. So I've had to grow up in that polar opposite environment. And when you see that, you see, you need to, I often say you need to be a little bit more like a chameleon. That doesn't mean you are not being your sincere self, but you have to adapt. Don't expect other people to adapt for you. You be the one to lead by example and adapt. And that's the EQ associated with it. Along with that is what I would call emotional resilience, right? And that is the ability to handle rejection, failure, and critical feedback. And I think a lot of people these days are getting a little bit sensitive around hearing things that maybe they don't want to hear. The openness of the mindset to embrace things from people within the ecosystem who you trust, who you know have your best interests at heart, provided you know that they're not going to steer you in the wrong direction. It may require another half hour of work or a little task that you don't want to do. But at the end, you have to take yourself out of that and say, is there a reason this is being done? And I need to have the humility to understand that. Commercial acumen, very important. You have to have the ability to translate all great ideas into what it means for someone else. And that means what it means for someone else in the business world in dollars and cents, because that's what it means to someone else. Um, and then I would say your strong personal brand. A lot of people in this environment are obviously building their profiles. They're on LinkedIn. Be careful how you build your profile on LinkedIn. Take a position, have a view, share your insights. Absolutely. But know that it can take a lifetime to build your reputation. But I have seen people destroy their public reputations on LinkedIn through getting silly in just non-professional discussions where, I, where you say, do you really want to promote this to 200,000 people across the network who are going to see that part of your character? So be mindful of the grant. Uh, be mindful of the impact on your brand. And, and really, I think the last part is, especially in the startup world, it's grit, right? Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll say this, just this last thing. As a CEO, I hate excuses. People make mistakes all the time. And number one culprit is me. But the first thing I do when I make a mistake is I admit it on the spot. I fall on my sword. I do not point at anyone else. And we say, how do we fix it? Now, if anyone makes a mistake with me, never feel scared. Just tell me what happened. All right, things happen. Let's fix it. Not the 15-minute discussion with they did this and oh, I kind of, uh, no CEO and no executive like Angelina as a CEO has time to listen to all of that unless it's a fact check to really work out the diagnostics of the problem. But overall, here's the problem. This is what I'm going to do to solve it. I, I want to let you know that ownership around it is important. And this comes into the aspect of what you would call grit. Because whenever anyone sees an Angelina or a me or someone that's done well, you automatically think, oh, they just got there. I can assure you Angelina has busted her ass in her career. Uh, she's telling you about her working hours. I work very similar hours. Oftentimes, I have to step in and make sure, look, this has to be delivered tomorrow. There's no excuse. We're not after an A minus an exam. That's not how you work in the real world. Um, it's either A plus or F. That's what I continually reinforce to the team. We either get it right or it's wrong. It's no partially right. Okay. It doesn't work like that. So the grit to be able to persevere. And, you know, the story that I tell is I have eaten so much crap on my journey and I have been rejected so many times um, from everything. And that has made me the person I am today because rejection is not rejection. It's not failure. It's just part of business and it's just life and it's okay. And the sooner you learn to accept that, the better. But I know that's a long-winded answer. I'm going to stop there. Ben, I think you should post back that post. Um, I think it was 
I, I love that list and I think you should really post it back up and uh, give it to FSDC because it's a good reminder um, to people of things that they need to do. And ultimately, Ben and myself and Faye and people that have responsibilities, it's you have no choice. You either deliver or die. Um, and um, I think that list that you just went through was very, very helpful. So thank you, thank you for thank that. You. Yeah. It's very important for uh, young starters to think from the perspective of your employer, or your boss. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, say one thing you just probably... said. One thing you said. If you make your boss look good, you look good. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the most important takeaway from I tell you, this is so, so true. Um, oh people go, God. what is my job? And just whatever your boss needs, right? And like or people often talk, needs. yeah, yeah. And what people often talk about this whole idea of like, uh, what is it? I, I think you understand because you're in control functions, but I am a believer in what I call command and control, empowerment and control. Like, and I believe there is a functional hierarchy that needs to exist with people who are empowered to do things within those levels. I believe in a hyper flat social structure, but any firm that says we're just completely flat, that firm, I don't know how it can operate. You have to have checks and balances along the way. Exactly. And Angelina would be the absolute epitome of this. Like, what the hell are you doing? You have to run this by me. I have to sign off. You're crazy. It doesn't make any sense. So yeah, I, I completely agree. But enable, enable the people, your boss and all those people around you in the ecosystem. The better you help and show your additional value and you're not dragging things down, the more you'll be rewarded and recognized. There's no question. Agree. Sorry, okay. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, yeah, uh, conscious of time, and as I see questions flooding in, let's uh, perhaps I will uh, because I think I we have addressed most of them. Perhaps I will pick three questions. Um, how about we start with Ben? I see it, uh, this question about how to prove your own value as a self-taught developer. As a self-taught developer, show yeah. what you've worked on, you know, uh, walk people through it, show why it's a unique process and journey. Um, self-taught is great. That shows commitment, ownership, drive. Like, you know, you weren't sitting there and listening to my boring lectures at business school. That is fantastic. And I think overall embrace these things. My career, no one taught me. I didn't have a boss to sit there and say, Ben, this is how you do it. I was just hungry enough to go out and learn it because I always wanted to be better. I didn't like being average. I didn't like being near. In all the endeavors that I pick in my life, I want to be the best I can possibly be in that because when I operate in that high performance culture, it only makes me better. So I love that. I love that environment, being around smart, intelligent people that drive you to be a better version of yourself. So always embrace it. I think a self-taught developer is great. Show people what you've done. Show people why it's special, what you've built, and how you can cut it with anyone else that's run through all those courses with the sign-offs. You can deliver just as good, and you've done it all on your own. But also take criticism. And if you're willing to take the criticism, you may think you have value, but if somebody's giving you comments that say, well, you need to switch this or maybe think about this, that, or the other, take criticism and, and learn from it. And yep. that's the school of hard knocks. And yep. that's how you become better at it. Yep, very true. Thank you. And then that question will be for Angelina. I see one about a, uh, recent, uh, a recent news about a uh, Chinese government official's comment on cryptocurrency as an investment option instead of currency. What's your interpretation on this? And how do you foresee Hong Kong to, uh, to you know, embrace crypto in the future? So digital assets in Hong Kong are um, now, as you are aware, there are, there's a consultation paper that's just closed from the SFC, uh, from F uh, FSTB from Chris Hoy. And then of course the virtual asset service uh, provider license, which is the one in seven. So Hong Kong has become the accepted place for digital assets. Whereas in China, they don't ban you from having digital assets, but uh, for anybody that has an exchange in Hong Kong, you cannot get access in China. So um, Hong Kong has a chance right now to become uh, a center of excellence for digital assets. Uh, it is an investment option uh, also, uh, but 
a lot of the use cases are being looked at. So you know that HKMA has tied up with uh, uh, um, uh, the Middle East as well as um, Thailand uh, to, and China to actually um, come up with the CBDC, uh, a joint one to work within um, all the different countries. And China itself is launching a CBDC. So you've got various things that are happening right now in the ecosystem. But in particular, Hong Kong has roughly 22 digital asset exchanges operating in Hong Kong right now. Some uh, that are focused to rate retail, which if you look at the rules, uh, they're going to change those rules. Um, but right now, while they can, they are uh, geared towards retail. And then for those of us who are trying to get licenses um, to deal with professional investors, um, uh, that's, for example, what my company is doing and what another company who has gotten their license already is doing. So in terms of what's my interpretation, I see Hong Kong um, continuing to be the center for digital assets. I see it also as the hotbed to work with other countries uh, to be a connector uh, with, with China to other countries um, and uh, to continue work in this area. But what we really need is we need people and young people out there to develop skills in programming. We need young people to get into this uh, area, into FinTech and start learning. And hey, if you're a self-taught developer, great. As long as you can develop and as long as you can write code, there are companies that need to hire these people. And um, uh, there's only growth in this area. The problem that we're seeing is people are going offshore. Um, you're seeing people moving to Singapore. Um, and I hope people will stay in Hong Kong. Um, I came here a long time ago. I love this place and I wanna see Hong Kong thrive and I wanna see Hong Kong be a FinTech center, which is one of the reasons that you hear me talk about this all the time, that we need to embrace technology and uh, move forward and develop that. So I think the options are good and Hong Kong will be the center uh, for China uh, for digital assets. Thank you. Actually, I would also like to uh, hear Ben's views on uh, the adoption of uh, DCEP in Hong Kong, because I see a question directed to you asking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the whole, this goes back to the whole uh, idea about whether uh, it's like, what is the future of digital assets and then Bitcoin as a contender to fiat and Look, my view is, will Bitcoin ever be a currency? No, I will say it here and now. It will never be a mainstream form of currency. Never. Um, because the development of these uh, central bank digital currencies is the future of how this is going to develop. And all of us will one day be spending our digital dollars. I, I have no doubt about it. Bitcoin is not going to serve that function. It has evolved into an investment asset, right? Uh, very speculative in nature, but notwithstanding that uh, legitimacy of the growth of this asset class. Um, but I don't think it will be people there paying in BTC. Now you've seen some cheeky announcements like Elon Musk, you can buy your Tesla in Bitcoin. Can you really go on the site and see what it's quoted as? And then the timelines from which to pay and all of these other things. The reality is if you think the asset's going to go up, why are you going to pay with it? Right. So it affects philosophy, too much volatility around its ability to act as a as a legitimate currency. But I think the DCEP growth is fantastic. Um, and I think it will be it will what I would call catalyze the legitimacy of cryptos even more as a as an asset class. And you're going to see much more as I go with uh, Angelina's points. Hong Kong will act as the hotbed for what I would say institutional growth of this space. It has very much been retail led. People have talked about institutional adoption for a long time. It's been quasi institutional because they've needed the infrastructure to develop the custody solutions, uh, ensuring that everything there, the walls, everything is secure and good. And now you're seeing more institutions starting to enter into this space. And I fundamentally think it's going to absolutely. This is the next 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 uh, next wave of growth. Totally agree with Ben, and you're seeing the SFC um, allow uh, crypto funds. Um, the first one was approved recently, um, so Bitcoin uh, will be allowed into digital digital asset management and certain funds, as yep. long as there's proper controls in place. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, I know I said three, but uh, people are enthusiastic. So if you don't mind, I will uh, ask two more. So this one will be for Angelina. Can you uh, please elaborate more about the control tip that you provided? I guess it's referring to the control function in, in FinTech. Um, controls, meaning um, maker checker. Controls, meaning have you done a background check? If you're going to be a digital asset exchange and one Bitcoin is $55,000 US or 56, have you checked that the people that you're hiring don't have a criminal background? Um, is there a, a maker checker? Um, uh, do you have accounting systems in place to make sure that you can do accounts and make sure you have a product control function to make sure that you've accounted for all your Bitcoin um, that you're trading on behalf of clients? Um, is there checks and independent uh, uh, checks and internal auditors checking your, your systems? Um, and I mean, the list goes on in terms of what is already in traditional finance. There are many of these controls that need to be moved into the digital asset area um, because nevertheless, these are worth something now. Uh, and what used to be when I got my first Bitcoin, what, what was worth $1,000 is now worth 55,000, 56,000. And these are the assets of the company. So putting in controls in place to make sure the assets of a company are in place, making sure that there are controls in place to um, actually help the company grow uh, and making sure that the company is well run. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Ben, do you wanna add anything? No, I, I think that's 100% right. It's just those, those checks and balances, making sure product is developed in the right way, sold in the right way. Um, and uh, I, I think you know this space far better than anyone in the room. So I fully concur with Angelina, yeah. One other last thing. I see a lot of crypto cowboys out there. And mm. you know what? Reputation is everything. Mm. And if you, once you lose your reputation, you're going to find it really hard to raise funds and it's really hard to come back. So your reputation and who you are is, is what you are, is, is paramount and having that control in place uh, and making sure that you, you watch your reputation and you don't get involved in bad things uh, is very, very important. Yeah. Um, so we see so many scams these days, and um, that's something that I, it really saddens me because it just sullies uh, this whole fledgling industry. So um, if, if people see it, they should call it out because it just affects your reputation and my reputation. That's right. There's one overlay in controls, which is it, get le it gets less attention, but I think it's the most important thing. And that is what I would call risk culture, right? The mindset yep. that everyone in an organization has around risk. This isn't a compliance job because we ended up in a situation where the bank's going, I want to do this, compliance stopping me. No, everyone's mindsets need to evolve to understand the organization's appetite, mindset, and attitudes towards risk. And risk. you can't palm that off elsewhere. Right. So yep. that's a big control aspect that I think needs more attention and doesn't get the attention it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina and Ben. I feel like we've covered most of the questions. So if you have nothing more to add, I would like to wrap up. I, you know, once again, thanking Angelina and Ben for joining us today. It was such a such a pleasure to have you with us. And going forward, the FSDC will continue to provide support to students and uh, young professionals to help you start and develop your career in the financial services industry. Uh, we will be doing this through our practitioner speaker series, which is this one, and various other initiatives under our Talent Amplifier program. Okay, so uh, thank you all for attending and uh, please stay, stay tuned. Thank you. So and before you go, on behalf of Ben and I, thank you, Faye, for being a moderator of yes. the Mosis. So My pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Real pleasure to be here, Andrew, Angelina yeah. and I. I know we love this stuff. So we're going to go have lunch and talk about it in a few weeks. So look forward to it. Okay. <laughs> good. good luck to all the students. Good luck have to the all right the mindset. students. I hope those tips help, but best of luck for your futures. Yep. Okay. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.